Just because someone, somebody, or something wants to come inside, well, that doesn't mean that you have to give them the key. Snap Judgment Underground Layer and WNYC Studios. You're listening to Spooked. Stay tuned. Spooked is supported by ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire quality talent fast. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within one day. Try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash spooked. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash spooked. Be afraid. Download the free TuneIn app and hear full episodes of Snap's new spinoff podcast, Spooked, three days early on TuneIn. Everyone wants something. Everyone. Rich or poor, young or old, living or dead. Everyone wants something. Of course, the question is, are you going to give it to them? I'm your host, Glenn Washington, and I want something too. But I'm patient. And I keep secrets. Spooked starts now. Prepare yourself for one of the most requested Snap Judgment stories of all time. You see, when Oscar Mendoza was born, his grandmother told his mom that this baby has a gift. Of course, Oscar will never say that she was wrong, but he thinks gift is the wrong word. Sensitive listeners, please note that this story contains graphic imagery and violence. Spooked. It all started with the annual family vacation to San Felipe. I always hated going to Mexico. We were used to creature comforts, you know, like TV and air conditioning. And over there, some people don't even have electricity. You know, the only times we would really enjoy is whenever we, there was a carnival in town. My father would drive literally from Dallas all the way to Mexico without stopping. It was like a 19-hour drive. When we first got there, it was maybe around 3 in the morning. That night, we stopped at a taco stand, and there was a dog that some way, somehow, just stuck to us. He just literally followed us home, and the next day he was there, and he just literally stayed with us all the time. And we lived on the main street. It was carnival, so there was rides everywhere, there were parades, and there were food vendors. Imagine the state fair, but in your house or in your neighborhood. That, that's how cool it was. The first thing I, I've seen was the girls in, in kind of like bikini things, you know, saying hi to everybody, and they're winking at people, they winked at us. And we, we got, you know, shy. <laughs> you know, it's, it's something you really don't see every day. Once we heard the music and we heard clowns were coming, we jumped on top of my dad's car. The clowns were, you know, making people laugh. We were having a good time. They're giving us candy. You know, we, we love candy. And then that's when we heard the explosion. We, we just saw this clown fly through the air and it landed maybe like a couple of feet away from us. We heard his, his, his body th- thump. We didn't know what was going on. We, we thought it was part of the act. And my brother, you know, he was just being jokester, like, was laughing. He was laughing and pointing. His face was toward the cement. And then my brother noticed that he turned around, the clown turned around and looked at us. You know what, I swear to God, he smiled at us. Had his look in his eyes, his eyes were open. And my brother almost peed in his pants. You know, he told me, he turned around and looked at me. And then once that happened, you know, my mother heard it and she came out and grabbed us and goes, get inside the house. 
Of course, we didn't listen. We ran up the stairs and we were on the balcony. And then we were looking at them, at the chaos from the top. And we, that's when we seen the whole view of the carnage. And what happened is that this truck had lost control coming into the town, instantly killing a bunch of people and hitting the clown car, making the clowns fly up in the air. Police came, they couldn't really do anything until somebody came in with a truck and put all the bodies on the trucks and took them away. And once everything cleared up, you know, they washed the streets off with water. Yeah, I, I felt in my bones we shouldn't have made fun of the clown. We, we ate dinner. We went to bed. My parents never brought it up. They figured, you know, don't talk about it, it never happened. We all started to sleep together because my brother was really scared. My brother wasn't one of those people that was really scared of anything. And to this day, he's the toughest guy I know. But, you know, that night he wasn't as tough. My older cousin, just she was just 15. And so she was our, kind of like our babysitter slash bodyguard. So yeah, we all slept in one bed. That night, around, I don't know, around three in the morning, my brother wakes up sweating. He asked my cousin, hey, can you go with me to the restroom? I, I, I need to get some water, I need to go to the restroom. My cousin, you know, she's older. She goes, sure, I'll, I'll go with you. She grabs his hand. In the room, there's two doors. One door leads to, my, to the hallway, that's my grandpa's room. This door would lead to the kitchen. They had a huge hole in the middle, like a round hole the size of a ball that we use as a handle. And my cousin held the door open. And as soon as she opened the door, that's when we saw him. We saw him sitting there. He was sitting in a chair looking toward the wall. He was wearing a gray jumpsuit. And he was wearing what I think was a, was a mask, a clown mask. He, he, was, he had a bald head with hair on the sides like a clown opaque white it wasn't makeup it wasn't a, it wasn't a mask that skin was too too real and i suddenly realized what clown that was that was the actual clown that we, my brother was laughing at and as soon as she opened the door that's when he turned around and my cousin shut the door real quick and that's when we heard the impact of the door it, it moved the door so bad, it, we, we thought it was going to break. And my cousin, you know, she's a pretty big girl. She was leaning against it. And my brother was leaning against it. And I jumped over and, and leaned against it, too. And every time it pushed, we could see him. Because once he hit the door, the, the door would swing open, and we would push it back. The thing was ramming itself against it. He stopped. And then he put his eye through the hole in the door, and we see his powdery face. He goes, he goes, let me in, let me in. Don't be mean. I just want to play with you. He he looked around, and then he put his arm through the hole and tried to grab my cousin's hair. He had a white glove with full of blood and his hand and his, his wrist was cut. And then we were crying and crying and screaming, Grandpa, Grandpa. As soon as we said Grandpa, my, my grandpa jumped out of his bed on the other side, we heard him. And he, and he had the dog in his room. He lets the dog go, we hear the dog run. And he ran, you know, ran to the streets of the kitchen. You know, he started growling and, and, and snarling and fighting him, you know, and, and that's what we heard. And then my grandfather came out with a gun. You know, he came out with a gun. He goes, who's there? You know, so I'm going to shoot you. But in Spanish, like, ¿Quién está allí? Los voy a matar. He goes, salgas de aquí, si no los mato. And it's, he ran up the stairs, whatever this thing was, ran up the stairs. And we heard it jump from the, from the, from the roof. And it landed on the cement, and I was thinking, this guy just killed himself. And 
we, my grandfather went outside. We're looking for blood or anything, nothing. It disappeared, whatever it was. You know, we would have seen something. We didn't see anything. As soon as uh, my grandfather walked in, we went looking for our dog and we found him next to the, to the patio, which is the yard in the middle of our house, laying there lifeless. It's, it's a tra traumatic situation when you see, when you hear an animal die, you know, trying to defend you. And my grandfather picked him up, put him in a towel and, and put him in a truck and took him away. You know, in the morning, the police came in. He looked at all the scene, and the only thing that was left in the kitchen was this pile of, of black ooze. It smelled horrible, and the police officer told my grandfather, you know, you should really get a priest over here and bless this house. You know, I don't think this guy was a clown. I think it was a diablo. It was a devil. And then, you know, my grandpa got really freaked out. After that, we we didn't we never studied in that house again. It, it was too horrific experience. And to this day, you know, my my brother and my cousins we discuss the same story over and over because nobody believes us. You know, like nobody believes that we saw a, a zombie clown. You know, that attacked us in the middle of the night. And, you know, the, the only thing I fear, and I fear for everybody that hears this this story whatever we experience will follow somebody. You know, because my grandma used to always tell me, don't ever talk about this. Because you don't want to release this thing to anybody else. And I truly believe that's true. Now then, you know how it is with the supernatural. You never get the proof. The tape recorder failed, or the camera didn't work, or some old nonsense. Well, not this time. Not this time. When Spook returns, we've got the goods. Stay tuned. Join the search for evidence of dark forces. We want to make an all-new season of Spook, but can only do so with your help. Spookpodcast.org. If you want to know what is on the other side, support this journey at spookpodcast.org. Get great gear, t-shirts, a hoodie, the mug. Talk to the spirits your damn self with the Spook Spirit Board, but do it now before it's too late. Spook Podcast. Org. Spooked is supported by ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire quality talent fast. With ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to 100 plus job sites with just one click. Then let ZipRecruiter's powerful technology match your job to the right candidates and use their simple dashboard to find your perfect hire. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter Get a quality candidate through the site within one day. Try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash spooked. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash spooked. Our next story comes to us from the city of fake ghosts, Los Angeles. But hold on, do not worry, because you're about to meet a real one. Spooked. I had gotten a camera from my father for Christmas, and I don't know, I took some pictures with it, and it was cool to have a Polaroid camera, but I didn't really think about it. And then uh, I was sitting in the house one afternoon. It was just an average day, and the bathroom door opened. Um, and no one was home, so I, I sensed that the door was opening by itself. I took the camera and I took a picture. 
nothing showed up in the picture and of course I felt kind of silly at the time and uh, and I just went back to working and then I remember sensing something and I looked up and the bathroom door opened in front of me and it seemed so demonstrative so I got up and I was actually nervous because it, something just felt like it was there Something was in the air, something was in the room with me. Tingling kind of sensation. And I started shaking, and I picked up the camera to take a picture, and I actually took a picture of, like, my was shaking so bad, I took the picture of, a, like, the top of the television set or something. And then I was like, okay, okay, calm down, calm down. <laughs> and then I took another picture. And that's when I got the first photograph of this experience. They're Polaroid photographs, so you basically sit and watch them develop. And as it was developing, I just saw this almost a stereotypical version of a ghost. It looks so, you know, the eyes, the big eyes and the screaming mouth and the sort of weird, wispy, you know, quality of it floating in the air. It's like going boo or something at you. And I remember, like, being really nervous about it. And then suddenly I thought, you know, this is my dad messed with the camera or something. That's what this was about. And then uh, I took another picture. It was almost like a similar image, but it was like the thing in the first photograph had moved closer to me and was more like, it was larger. And then I started getting like nervous again. You know, I just kept going back and forth between incredulous and denial. And then when Mikowski got home, I, I said, I have something I want to show you. What do you think about this? And I showed him the pictures. So he shows me these photos. I'm like, wow, these are really cool. How'd you do this? He goes, I just took these pictures. I, I didn't do it. It just was. Says, no, they're all, you made this out. He says, here, take a picture. And I went over and stood in the what is now known as the vortex, but it's the area right in front of the bathroom. And he took a picture of me, and over top of me was this similar type shape, but it was like larger and more strange. I felt out of control, like I didn't know what was happening, and I didn't know where to put it in my mind. And we ran out of film. After like a month of just sort of sitting with these photographs, we decided to go out and get some more film. And we just thought, okay, well, here's the moment. We find out whether this is real or not. We try to take pictures when we'd sense something or feel something. We kind of describe it as like when you have like a goosebumps or like a little bit of a sunburn, you kind of sense this tingling thing. And then that's when you take the picture. Half the time we wouldn't get anything, but sometimes we would. And that encouraged us to keep getting more film. This was, what, three or four months of this. It was too strange and we were afraid people would think we were nuts, but then it just got to be too much to not tell anybody about it. I mean, how do you share this? Why would you, you know, people think we're insane? Finally, we decided to invite a bunch of friends over and show them the photographs. We said, we have something to tell you guys, and it's a little strange, but we want to share it with you. So we started showing them the pictures, and they're asking, you know, a thousand questions a mile a minute. One of our friends, um, he asked if he's here now, if the whatever it was was here now. And this is well, let's take a picture. snapped a picture and then we're all watching it someone said oh my god i think this is a word you could see the word yes and that was the beginning of the communication it's one thing to get like you know ectoplasmic fluffy white things and it's another to get communication like it answered our question and then someone grabbed a camera and went are you a, are you a, uh, what was it? Are you a friend or? Are you a good ghost or a bad ghost? That's what it was. 
the photo came out, a single word in the middle of the room, it said friend. It was clear, not on the photo, in the photo. In the photo, yeah. They're actually in the photograph. They're like in the room, but it's like written in light and clouds, kind of. Clear letters you can easily read. Like when you asked him his name, you could clearly see it said right. W-R-I-G-H-T. So we asked, where do you go when you're not here? And we took a picture and the photograph said flux. So we thought, oh, I guess he's in the flux, whatever that is. There's one really interesting Polaroid. The question was, are you a ghost or a spirit? Show us what you look like. And his answer was, he says in the Polaroid, not ready. So that was really interesting. When that happened, I was thinking, is he not ready? Or does he think that we're not ready? With all the people there, it kind of uh, validated us because we weren't insane. And this was happening in front of other people. Uh, we were not manipulating the camera or the film in any way. It was just... I think it changed a lot of people on a profound level, permanently. And I remember for like a week just kind of walking around in the days going, okay, what is this again? How do I, how do I fit this into the way I thought the world worked? We, we really had never intended to, I guess, go public with it. It was nothing we really thought about. And there was a new show on TV called Sightings, and John was watching it, and they had this ghost thing on there and they had a, a picture of some stuff and it and John goes well, that's not a ghost picture this is a ghost picture so he sent a copy in to the sightings people they called us up and next thing you know they wanted to do an hour long satellite live show from the house after we did the sightings episode it seemed like suddenly we had offers to do quite a few different shows they took the camera, they examined the camera, they took it to Polaroid, they examined it, they examined all the photographs. Yeah, through the years, there's been so many theories on how it's being done, how we do it, how we create the, uh, the ghost images. One of my favorite theories, someone said that how the photographs are done is that there's a little person in the basement and what happens is, is when you ask a question to the air, they type in in a computer and it's projected out through lasers in the house that writes on the photograph instantly. Would you start going on about like, you know, like, well, they, it's real easy to just take a pen and write on the back of the Polaroid and it will come through. And has anybody ever tried that? Because if you do, because we tried it, we actually tried it. We took a pen and it leaves marks and it doesn't look like anything it looks like someone took a pen and wrote on a polaroid i don't know wh how that theory has gone around and around and around i appreciated all the things the scientists and the fbi agent and everybody did in the photographic expert to try to disprove it they even did like voice analysis of us to find out if we were like it was sort of a lie detector test kind of thing He's here for us. He's not here to, like, exploit. We're not out to make anybody believe anything. This is what's happening to us. Pretty much we stopped all the interviews, especially because there's always backlash to it. How are charlatans and how it can be done and all this other stuff that we're just, just trying to make a buck off this thing. And really, none of that's true. We're not making any money off this thing. It's... It's a personal thing that we just happen to want to share a little bit of. And there have been people who said, well, you know, we'll give you a hundred bucks if you let us come take a picture at your house. And that's something we would never do because it's not about that. One of the most meaningful things for, for me and John, we were struggling writers and we would get messages that tell us to uh, persevere, to keep going and just continue what we're doing and something good will happen. As creative people, we faced a lot of self-doubt and it can be crippling. At some point we ask, we ask, right, should we keep pursuing what we love even if it's hard? And he came back with the photograph, he said, dreams and destiny merge. And we thought, you know, it's not about like 
being successful at the moment. It's about dreaming things and allowing your destiny to present itself. It changed our perspective. The house has a way of letting you know that it's okay to be insecure, but to not ever give up. There's something, there's something special happening in my house, and it just makes you f feel like small and just insignificant when it comes to the whole world. You know there's something bigger, something better, something grander. Big thanks to John Huckard and John Murkowski. Check out our website to see pictures of the actual Polaroid ghost, spookpodcast.org. We'll also have info on what John and John are up to now. You're going to want to see this. Spookpodcast.org. If you're dying to hear more about the creepy life of Oscar Mendoza, who told the first story about the zombie clown, listen to the podcast Real Ghost Stories Online. You'll hear stories from him and many others details on our website spookpodcast.org and the next spooked just because they're ghost doesn't mean that they don't want love to be afraid those are the stories that we have for you but we want to hear the stories you have for us hit us on the spook line let us know your story record onto your phone device thing send it to spooked at spookpodcast.org Spooked Monster Mash team includes Mark Wistich, Liza Smith, Anna Adlerstein, Liz Mack, Anna Sussman, Jasmine Aguilera, Teo Decott, and Jody Collin. Original music by Pat Masini Miller, Leon Morimoto, and Renzo Gorio. If you're digging Spook, let somebody know. There are now 11 episodes available. Download them all. Halloween is almost here. Spookpodcast.org. And you heard, right? We're speeding it up. Two spook episodes a week. Now, if you need your spook fix early, you can hear new spook episodes three days early. Just download the TuneIn app, spookpodcast.org. Hit me on the Twitter, the Instagram, the Facebook, Spook Pod. And don't forget, when walking down the dark street, you see that person with the amazing costume, the hair squirming like a thousand undulating snakes, the eyes, dark sockets, the movements, jerky, inhuman. This encounter, it may just have been avoided if you would only heed my heartfelt advice to never, ever, never, ever, never, never, ever turn out the light. You have reached the end of the episode, but not the end of the journey. If you want an all-new season of Spook Storytelling, support the show that makes it happen. Spookpodcast.org